So good morning, everyone, and welcome to Is Starting a Nonprofit Right for You? I'm Caitlin Seifritz, the Nonprofit Services Supervisor at the Regional Foundation Center, and I will be leading today's workshop. Um, but first, and before we get started, I just wanted to go over some logistics. We are recording today's session, and we will email out the recording within 48 hours. Unfortunately, I'm not able to share the slides with you because they are provided by Candid, which I'll speak more about in just a moment. However, we are sharing a link to a resource guide in the chat, and that guide has links and information included in today's workshop. If any other resources get mentioned or people uh, bring up questions and we talk about resources that aren't already included in that resource guide, then I will update the guide with that information. And when I send out the follow-up email with the recording, I will also be sure to include a link to that guide as well. If you are having any issues or if you have any questions, please use the chat feature. My colleague Jillian will be monitoring the chat box. I'll also be stopping a couple of times throughout the session to answer questions, but feel free to add your questions in the chat as you think of them. And then lastly, at the end of the session, we will be providing a link to a survey, and we'd love to hear your feedback about this workshop and any other workshops you'd like to see us present. Uh, this is actually the first time we're offering this version of this class. We've done a few iterations of this class in the past, so we'd love to hear um, what you all think of it um, using that form. So for those of you who are joining us for the first time, I did want to share a little bit more about who we are and what we do. The Regional Foundation Center is a nonprofit resource center at the Free Library of Philadelphia. We have been serving Philly's nonprofit community since 1974. We provide access to high quality research databases, free workshops, and one-on-one -on -one research appointments with librarians. We are part of the library's Business Resource and Innovation Center, or the BRIC. And the BRIC is a space for entrepreneurs, nonprofit professionals, job seekers, and inventors. Um, on the slide there, you can see a picture of our beautiful new space that was opened in April 2019. So our physical space is currently closed um, and we've moved all of our programs and services online. Um, but I do hope once it's safe to do so and once we've reopened, you'll come and check out our beautiful space. So some of you may have heard of two organizations, <clears throat> Foundation Center and GuideStar. These two nonprofit organizations merged in February of 2019 to create a new organization called Candid. As leaders in the world of philanthropic data, the merger of these two organizations means even more data being collected on the philanthropic sector. So what does this have to do with the Regional Foundation Center? Well, we are part of Candid's Funding Information Network a network of libraries, community foundations, and nonprofit resource centers across the globe where you can access databases, print materials, and free classes. Um, we get our materials for our classes um, from Candid, which is why I'm not able to email out the slides to you. Um, but again, the resource guide that we shared with you in the chat has all the information, highlights, and resources that we're going to be talking about today. So let's get started. So I'm gonna give you a quick tour of what you will learn um, during our time together. Uh, first, I'm gonna outline the steps involved in starting a nonprofit. Then I'll provide you with some guidance to help you assess the alternatives to starting a nonprofit. I'll also provide a tour of the nonprofit startup assessment tool, which you can use to de determine next steps depending on where you are in the startup process. Throughout the presentation, I will refer to additional resources that can help you along your startup journey. Again, all those resources are included in your resource guide. I also recognize that since you are all in slightly different places, uh, you will take different things back with you. So I also wanna make sure that you get all of your burning questions answered. So as I mentioned before, we will be stopping um, throughout the presentation to answer any questions. Um, I also scheduled this session for an hour and a half I probably will not be talking for that entire hour and a half, um, but I will leave plenty of time at the end um, to answer any additional questions people have. So before we get started, I do have a little pop quiz for you. Um, so I just have a few questions to kind of test your nonprofit knowledge and absolutely no worries if you don't know the answer. Um, just take your best guess and hopefully by the end of today's session, 
you'll understand um, the answers uh, to these questions and be better informed um, about the process of starting a nonprofit. So I'm going to launch a poll. And the poll has three questions. They're all true or false questions. So go ahead and answer those three questions. They are anonymous. Um, again, if you're not sure of the answer, just take your best guess, and then we'll go over the answers to those. Okay, looks like most people have answered. I'll give you all just a few more minutes to put in your answers. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to go ahead and end the polling and share the results with you. And then we're going to discuss um, the, the different um, questions and answers. So the first question was true or false? A nonprofit board is officially in charge of the nonprofit, not the executive director. So 58% of you said that that statement is true. Um, and for those of you who said true, that is correct. The board is the legal entity responsible for the governance of the nonprofit organization, not the executive director. Next, um, true or false, the information on nonprofit tax forms is public, publicly available. So that is true and you all got that right, that's awesome. So tax exempt nonprofits are required to provide copies upon request of their three most recently filed annual information returns, the IRS Form 990, um, and their, as well as their application for tax exemption. So a nonprofit's 990s are available through the IRS website as well as GuideStar. So great, kudos to all of you for getting that one right. And then our last question, um, true or false, nonprofits cannot earn revenue. And you all got that one correct. That statement is false. As long as earned revenues are related to the mission of the organization, um, then they are allowed uh, by the IRS to um, bring in money. Plus you have to sustain yourself. Um, so that was awesome. You guys did great with those uh, pop quiz questions. So thank you so much for participating in those. We're going to go into a little bit more detail about some of these um, some of these questions, um, and I'm happy to answer any additional questions that you might have um, about any of these as well. All right. So um, before we get into all this, I just want to make a statement that I am not a lawyer or an accountant. Um, I am a librarian, um, so I can't interpret the leg legality of anything um, that you have in mind but I'll make sure that you know about resources and organizations that you'll have access to in order to answer the questions you'll need. In fact, we have one of those organizations here today. Um, in just a moment, I'm going to introduce you to a representative from Philadelphia VIP, a nonprofit organization that provides pro bono legal services to nonprofits and small businesses. But first, let's explore the official legal definition of a nonprofit as described by the IRS. More specifically, this is the definition of a public charity from the IRS code section 501c3. Um, so these entities are organized and operated exclusively for one or more charitable purposes. The most important characteristic of a public charity is its focus on exempt purposes. Barris has a long definition of these, and I've included a link to that definition um, in your resource guide. But the easiest way to understand it is that they are set up to benefit others rather than oneself. In other words, the nonprofit must be organized and operated exclusively for one or more charitable purposes. Next, <clears throat> no part of the earnings will be of benefit to private shareholders or individuals. 
um, and it's not organized for the benefit of, <clears throat> excuse me, for private interest. So that kind of goes back to that question I had about revenue. So your organization is certainly welcome to raise money for the organization. It just can't benefit um, a specific individual. Also, a nonprofit is different from a for-profit because it cannot be set up to benefit investors for someone just to get rich. Uh, people can be paid to work for a nonprofit, but that can't be the sole reason that the nonprofit exists. It must help um, a cause, um, someone or something. Next, um, a 501c3 organization will not attempt to influence legis legislation or participate in a political campaign as a substantial part of its activities. The other main thing a 501c3 nonprofit can't do is that it can't be solely a political organization. It can advocate for policies and political issues some of the time, but it cannot say vote for this specific person. If you're not sure about this or how it relates to your plans, the IRS has a nice description of nonprofits and lobbying um, that you might want to look at. And again, I included a link to that in your resource guide. So speaking of the IRS, here is a one slide detail on the legal elements of starting a nonprofit. You may not get to this part, uh, but I wanted to start with it because some people think that these steps are the most important part of starting your organization, but it isn't. It's the legal steps to becoming a tax exempt organization. You're going to talk, we're gonna talk more um, after we discuss the elements of a nonprofit's operations, um, but I wanted to review the steps for those of you who don't know. And if anyone has recently gone through this process, um, feel free to share in the chat what your experience was like. Was it good, bad, easy, difficult? When we talk about these legal steps in this class, we always make sure um, to recommend that you don't do it alone. The language of these legal documents requires a certain structure that is much easier to negotiate with the help of a lawyer. Um, so lawyers aren't cheap, um, but as I mentioned earlier, you'll be hearing from Philly VIP um, in just a moment, moment about their pro bono services um, for nonprofits. If you do wanna do it yourself, be sure to follow the instructions. There are several, uh, several publishers, um, NOLO, N-O-L-O, -O, um, is one of the most famous, but they publish up-to-date books on the legal process. Um, and we have a few of those books on the process of starting a nonprofit that you can check out from the Regional Foundation Center. Um, so I included links to those books um, in your resource guide. So if you want a physical book to look at um, to, to, um, that explains the different steps, I highly recommend checking out those books. I also included a link to Candid's um, ebook library, which anyone um, can access for free. So if you'd like to check out an ebook version um, about starting a nonprofit, there's also um, that link as well. But the steps on this slide constitute the bare bones legal definition of starting a nonprofit. Even if you follow the directions to the letter, you're only legally a nonprofit. But what you want to be is substantially a nonprofit, something that people want to invest in and rely on. To get at all the main components of a uh, nonprofit, we're going to talk about your nonprofit plan. Um, so I know a lot of people probably came to this class thinking that I was just going to tell you the specific forms you're going to have to fill out. And we'd go into detail about these steps. But really what this class is about is how to put a plan together to start a nonprofit. Um, going beyond the specific forms that you have to um, fill out and thinking more about how to put together a substantial nonprofit. But before we get into that plan, I am going to introduce Evie Cruz, who is the nonprofit and small business coordinator at Philly VIP. And Philly or um, Evie is going to briefly tell you about Philly VIP's services uh, for nonprofits. So welcome, Evie. Thank you, Caitlin, for having me here, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, so as Caitlin mentioned, we are a nonprofit um, pro bono legal services agency based here in Philadelphia. And what that means is that we um, leverage the, um, the time and effort of volunteer attorneys who work at firms and corporations in the Philadelphia area to provide pro bono assistance to all sorts of, of clients here in Philly. Um, and my role is to um, help all of the small business and nonprofit clients here in Philadelphia. 
So we help with all sorts of um, transactional legal issues, everything from starting a nonprofit, as you're learning about today, to filing trademarks, um, negotiating commercial leases, drafting contracts with vendors, both for nonprofits and small businesses. So um, uh, we are a resource for you if you do require uh, legal assistance with filing for um, you know, your tax exempt status as, as Caitlin ex explained on the last slide, or if you need some help with something else such as um, you know, creating an employment manual for your employees if you have any, or negotiating a commercial lease to have a physical space for your nonprofit. So we can help with all sorts of things like that. Um, we do have a few eligibility requirements for our nonprofits that they don't necessarily need to be based in Philadelphia, but they do need to serve the Philadelphia public or the Philadelphia public interest. And also um, we need to evaluate your budget to make sure that you do not have so much revenue that you could comfortably afford a lawyer without significantly hurting your programming or services to the community. So as long as you meet those two requirements and most nonprofits in Philadelphia do, we should be able to help you along your way, whether it's formation, contracts, um, getting a trademark for your name and logo, anything like that. Um, so I'm gonna drop a link to our application in the chat. And so you can just apply online and I will see, I, I'm the, basically the only person to handle these cases. So I will see your application directly and I'll reach out to you to um, help you find a volunteer attorney to assist you with whatever you need help with. And um, just know that you should stay on to the end of this presentation because we really want to help uh, nonprofits that have gone through this planning process that Caitlin is going to describe before you come to us with the legal need because the legal stuff as Caitlin described is not what you know the first thing that you need to do when starting a nonprofit you need to get some other things out of the way first. Um, and I see a question in the chat uh, serve Philadelphia City only a greater Philadelphia region so as I said for nonprofit clients, um, it can be in the greater Philadelphia region as long as the community that the nonprofit is serving is in Philadelphia primarily. So if it's a completely New Jersey based nonprofit that doesn't do anything in Philly, then no, we're not going to help. But if you're based in Wayne or, you know, a Delco or something, but you are serving, let's say, like a Philadelphia high school primarily, then we would definitely assist with that nonprofit. Small businesses do need to be in the city of Philadelphia proper, but uh, most of you are here for nonprofits. So, all right, um, and I'll be around for any more questions. If you have them, you can put them in the chat and I'll, I'll stick around to the end if you, anyone else has questions about our services. So, thank you. Thanks, Evie, that's super helpful. I really encourage everyone who has any legal questions or is going through this process to take advantage of this free resource, you know, especially at the beginning, um, you know, most nonprofits, don't have a ton of money when they're starting out. So it's really helpful to take advantage of all of these free resources that you can. Um, so this is one of our favorites. We are constantly referring people um, to Philly VIP. They're wonderful to work with and um, they're just really great for supporting the nonprofit community. So thank you so much Evie for being here today. Like she said, she'll be sticking around. So if you have additional questions um, after we go through the presentation, um, she can answer those. And then um, the link that she shared in the chat, we'll make sure that um, that's included in the resource guide as well. So, all right, onward we go. Um, so now that we have just touched the surface on the legal elements of starting a nonprofit and where you can, le can get legal assistance, um, I'm just curious where you all are in the process of starting a nonprofit. So I have another poll for you. Um, give me one second. So I'm curious where you all are. So I'm going to um, launch this poll. So go ahead and choose the response that best fits um, where you are in the process of starting um, a nonprofit. Um, and if there's something on, if there's another option that doesn't fit with what you're doing, feel free to add that in the chat. Um, we'd love to hear um, what everyone, what place everyone is in right now. So I'll give you just a couple more seconds. All right, so I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. <clears throat> so it looks like most of you are considering it. Um, 
and thinking of forming one sometime this year. So 54% of you said that. One person said they're newly formed. So they're in the very beginning stages of this. Um, and that's great. You're still, you're always gonna be planning. Um, so you'll definitely take away some stuff from this class. And then a few of you aren't, aren't sure. Um, so that's great. And hopefully after today, you'll have a better sense of what direction um, you want to go in. So I'm going to end that poll. Um, and like I said, regardless of where you are in the process, today's workshop will help you build your skills and knowledge, not just around the process of starting a nonprofit, but how to develop a plan that will lay the groundwork for success. So as we saw with our poll questions, um, you know, many of you are in different places when it comes to your plans for a startup, and that's okay. Um, as I, you know, keep mentioning, this is, um, you know, something anyone can learn from no matter where you are in the process. Um, you know, when you start a nonprofit, it's not like you set it and forget it. <laughs> this is something that you are going to constantly be adapting, adjusting um, to help move the nonprofit forward. Um, many people um, look at nonprofits in different ways, but one way we often look at them is, are they fundable? So would anyone like to invest in your plan? So every item you see here on the list should be something that you consider throughout the life of your nonprofit, um, not just in the planning phases. So we're going to talk about them in um, the order that they're listed here. Um, but you should think about them if you're you know, creating your nonprofit from scratch, taking your idea to reality. So we're going to talk about mission, vision, and values, um, how to do an environmental or field scan, your team, the need, programs and services that your nonprofit will offer, your finances, and then marketing and research. So when we talk about starting a nonprofit, we start with the mission because the mission is the most important part of what you do. Can anyone define what purpose a nonprofit's mission serves? Feel free to unmute yourself or use the chat. What's the point of a nonprofit's mission? To have a purpose. To have a purpose, great, yeah. yep. Anyone else wanna share? So here is the official definition of a mission or mission statement. Uh, basically the mission is what you're going to do on a day-to-day -day basis. So who you're helping, what you're doing and why you're doing it. The mission is what tells anyone interested from the IRS to donors to someone you meet on an elevator, what your organization stands for. Now it can be differentiated from your vision in that your vision or your vision statement goes further than the mission. It doesn't tell anyone what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, but it tells interested people what you're striving for. <clears throat> so what you intend the world to look like if you are successful at what you do. So for example, maybe your vision is a world where every child can read by age three, or a world where clean water is available to everyone. So Generally speaking, your mission is not something you're going to accomplish tomorrow or today, or maybe even within a year. Um, but it's what, you, <clears throat> it's what you do your work every day to bring about. So it's kind of a broader view um, of what your goals are. Both your vision and your mission are based on your values. These are your deeply held beliefs that form the rock layer beneath the more formal expression of what your nonprofit is about, what you believe in, what drives you, what you're passionate about. Those are your values. Your mission and vision communicate those values to anyone else in a more formal manner. When you tell the story of your nonprofit and try, <clears throat> and try to interest others in it, you're trying to find others who share those values. When we teach grant seeking, for example, we talk about finding funders whose interest areas are a fit with yours. Another way of saying that is, do they share your values? Um, so everyone is probably pretty familiar with Bill Gates and his philanthropic endeavors. And for, 
him and his wife, um, he's been very clear about his foundation's values. Um, him and his wife value education, they value international health, they value the use of technology for all. These values inform the giving of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and they look to find and fund nonprofits whose mission and vision express and embrace these values. Keep in mind though, just because they're interested in the same population or issue as you, doesn't mean that a funder or a person shares your values. For example, you could assume that a nonprofit that works with single mothers shares values with another that works with single mothers. But without knowing more about their values, religious, ethical, conservative, or liberal, you can't tell too much about them. So a helpful exercise for anyone who is starting out, which I know a lot of you um, in the class today are, is doing this very short exercise. Um, you know, for some of you who have thought through this more, it may be easier. For those of you who have already started, um, it might be easier. Um, some of you may already have a mission, but you might not have thought about your vision or what you value. Um, so this is a helpful exercise, you know, you don't need any complicated worksheets or forms or anything to do this, um, but it will just help you start to think about what is important to you and to the mission, um, vision, and values of your organization. So has anyone gone through this process of thinking about either their mission, vision, or values? Feel free to add in the chat if you already have a mission or if you'd like to unmute yourself and share what the experience was like creating um, your mission, vision, or values. Okay, so someone said they've crafted their mission and vision, but they're still working on their values. Okay, great. <clears throat> Anyone else? get to this point yet in the process? It's okay if you haven't. Um, I know a lot of you are just kind of learning what this is all about, but it's a really important first step um, because it's really gonna help you focus in on what it is that you want to do. Great. So some of you have thought through the mission and vision. Um, so you've started the process. Um, some of you might just need to take it a step further and think about the values as well. So great, thank you for sharing. Um, so again, you know, this is really at the heart of what it means to be a nonprofit, to be able to tell your story and communicate your passion through what you say. <clears throat> this is an exercise you're gonna be doing over and over again in many ways as your organization grows. Um, so again, this is all part of this planning process. It's very fluid. Um, some things may need to be tweaked or changed um, as the organization evolves. So once you've done this short exercise, um, it may be helpful to use a more formal structure to map out your idea. So if anyone of you has worked in the business world before, you may have heard of something called the business model canvas. This is a design thinking tool to help entrepreneurs map out a business idea in a visual way. So a local uh, nonprofit leader, um, Tavani DeVore, um, who's actually going to be leading our Fiscal Sponsorship 101 workshop next week, adapted the business model canvas to nonprofits. And it's called the Nonprofit Ecosystem Blueprint. Um, so I have a screenshot of it here. Um, I also included a link to it in your resource guide. Um, but each of these different boxes um, describes something about your organization, what your organization values, who your partners are, how you're going to do marketing and outreach, who your audience or consumers are. Um, so it's a really great way to start to put your nonprofit plan into action um, and write out you know, what you're thinking and how you'd like to see this nonprofit um, played out. So I highly recommend um, using this as a tool to think through you know, what, what your plan is for your nonprofit. So I'm gonna pause there and see if we have any questions about anything we've talked about um, so far. Um, so at what stage do you suggest using the blueprint? Um, so I 
suggest this is something like any kind of planning tool that you can use at any point throughout the process. If you're starting a new program or service, that can be a helpful tool. But for anyone who's in the beginning stages of starting a nonprofit, it's a great thing to think about right at the beginning. Um, so like I said, the mission, vision, values exercise, that's a good basic starting point. And then from there, you can start to think about who your partners are, how you're gonna be funding this, um, who, your, um, who your clients are, who it is that you're trying to reach. So I recommend doing this early on. And again, this is something that can be adapted and changed um, as needed, or if you're looking to start a new program or service. So good question. Um, so for value is compassion too broad. Um, I mean, I, I think it really comes down to what you want to communicate um, with other people. Um, I think as long as your uh, mission and vision are a little bit more specific, more formal, um, then compassion is certainly a great value to have. So um, I think that's fine. Um, and it looks like Patrice, you raised your hand. Did you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? Yes, hi. Hi. I do have a question. Um, I already started my nonprofit, but the only thing that I'm facing is um, I don't have the funds to establish my 501c3. And I want to know, is there any way, um, how can I go about that to establish my 501c3? Because um, I'm down here in the Kensington area where um, I feed the homeless and um, I have a lot where I, I, I help them off the streets and I help people with the opiate yoys and I take them off the streets and I feed them. And um, I put mostly everything that I had into my program, whereas I'm going completely broke. Right. So, and I don't have any partners and nothing like that, but, and it's hard and people see my program, but it's like, no one is working with me because I'm like the little dog and I don't have bigger, just bigger organizations than me that, um, I know it's really hard and I look feel like um, I'm get, I get overlooked because I'm not as big as other organizations and stuff like that. And I'm doing mostly all the work, but I don't get the credit for the things that I'm doing, you know, and I really need, I'm, I'm really helping these people and I really want to help them, but I don't think that I can continue helping them if I don't get the proper help or, you know, proper partners and, you know, proper things that so, I need to get to for my program to go. So I have a few suggestions and you know, this applies to anyone on the call as well, is that, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about this in just a minute, but for anyone who's starting out, especially if you don't have the funds to get the 501c3 status, then I definitely recommend exploring something called fiscal sponsorship, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit later on. And we have a whole session about next week, but this allows you um, to start a nonprofit, to do the work you're doing without the initial costs and paperwork associated with it. Um, also, it's really important at the beginning, you know, especially if you're having a hard time finding partners, getting funders, that type of thing, to think about what your plan is. You know, as I said earlier, you want to think about is your nonprofit, is your idea fundable? Um, so you want to be able to put a plan together to say, this is fundable. This is something that you should invest in. Um, so, you know, I think some of the things we're going to talk about today, as well as fiscal sponsorship might be useful to you um, and to anyone else on the call. So that is, that's a good question. Um, all right. So we are going to move on. Um, again, we'll be answering more questions um, throughout the class. So keep them coming in the chat or feel free um, to wait until we get to the next question section. So we're now going to talk about that plan. So after deciding on your mission, vision, and values, doing an environmental scan is the next phase. In essence, this phase means now that I'm clear on what I want to do with my mission, is anyone else doing this work? And spoiler alert, someone else probably is, but that's okay. <laughs> 
Um, so sometimes your environmental scan is easy. Did you get your idea from a nonprofit that's working successfully somewhere else, but not here? Or if you're thinking about your neighborhood and you have an original idea, are you sure it's original? Uh, look at other neighborhoods or cities to see if an organization is doing something similar. It's not a bad thing if a similar organization or program exists. It means that there is a need out there. It also means that you'll have an existing model um, or potential partner um, to base your organization off of. Once you've identified similar organizations, you should think about what makes your mission, your approach, or community different from what's already out there. Remember that when you start a nonprofit and you're trying to make a go of it, you'll be trying to get support from funders, other nonprofits, and individuals who want to know why should they support your new idea? What makes you distinct or innovative? What makes you essential to this area? So you want to think about these points um, on the slide here. Um, <clears throat> how do you differ from other nonprofits in your area? What do, um, what do you do that no one else does? And what happens if you don't exist? So in the business world, this process, this environmental scan, thinking through these questions is called competitive analysis. Um, and I see a lot of nonprofits skip this step and it hurts them in the long run. Again, it's okay if there are other nonprofits out there working to meet a similar mission. No one profit owns a cause. But by doing the research to see who your quote competitors are, you'll find allies, potential partners, and cheerleaders along the way. There are many places to find information on existing nonprofits. I'm sure some of you already know about ones that are operating um, in your neighborhood or in the Philadelphia area. Um, so you could also use Google or GuideStar um, to find others. Um, so one resource that you can um, use to find out who's doing um, charitable work in your area is 211. Um, this is a nationwide telephone and website-based service, um, usually tied to the United Way, um, that gives referrals to existing nonprofits in your area. So somebody could call them up and say, I'm looking for a food bank in my zip code or my city, and they'll refer them um, to that resource. But they can be helpful for all of you as well, because you can look on their website um, to find out who's doing similar work. Um, to what you're doing. You know, it doesn't hurt to know who these organizations are. Maybe they would be interested in talking to you, giving you some insights, um, maybe partnering with you. Chances are that if they're similar to you, but not the same, you'll want to work together. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to do a very quick demo of um, our local 211 site, as well as GuideStar um, to show you how to do an environmental scan. So I am going to share um, my screen. <clears throat> uh, so I'm going to start with GuideStar first. <clears throat> so GuideStar, for any of you who are unfamiliar, is kind of a storing house of nonprofit 990s um, and profiles about nonprofit organizations. This is a free website to use. Um, I do recommend creating a free account on the website, though. It will just give you access to some more information. So the search is very simple. I'm on the homepage here, guidestar.org. I'm just gonna click on the search button. And then from there, I can choose my search criteria on the left-hand side. So I'm gonna start by putting in our state, Pennsylvania. Um, I'm then going to select the city of Philadelphia from this drop-down menu. Whoops, went too far. There we go. You'll notice that there are just over 9,000 nonprofits in Philadelphia. Pretty big number. So we have our geographic criteria. You're probably not going to want to sort through 9,000 nonprofits. Um, so if I click on this organization tab and scroll down, I can choose a subject area or population served. So this will help me identify nonprofits that are doing similar work to what I'm doing. You can see the uh, different um, subject area categories we have. Um, so if I go under human services, for example, 
And I want to see organizations that are um, providing basic and emergency aid in the Philadelphia area. I can put that checkbox um, next to that subject area. And then I have a list of 86 nonprofits um, that are in Philadelphia providing basic and emergency aid. Um, so for any of these nonprofits, you can learn more about them by clicking on their name. And then you can see their mission, when they were started, um, where they're located. You can see any of their um, 990s. So again, those are those publicly accessible um, tax forms um, that nonprofits submit each year. You can take a look at those, see how much money they're spending um, on different things, how much money they're bringing in from grants. And then as you scroll through the profile, you can get some more information about them, what their programs are. This particular um, organization added some photos and videos, what their results are. Um, so each nonprofit can add additional information to their profile. Um, so this particular nonprofit, if I scroll back up to the top, has a gold um, seal. So that means they've added more information about their organization to their profile than somebody that had a, a bronze or silver. Um, so when you see one of those seals, it means that the nonprofit has updated their profile to provide additional information. So, you know, this is a, again, a great resource to just see who else is doing this work. They have links to websites. You can find out who the executive director is. You know, maybe you know someone there. Maybe you wanna reach out to them to have a conversation. Um, so GuideStar is one useful uh, tool for doing this environmental scan. And then another one is that 211 website I mentioned. So this is the one specifically for uh, Southeast Pennsylvania. So 211sepa.org. So on this website, if you go to get help and click on search for services, you can then um, choose which services you'd like to, to look. Um, you can also add uh, a geography. So for example, if I start typing in Philadelphia, I can add Philadelphia County and I can then choose a service. Um, so if I clicked on basic needs, <clears throat> um, we could go to food, for example. Maybe I'm interested in who's providing community meals in Philadelphia. And then I would see a list of organizations that meet that criteria, where they're located, um, I can get a little bit more information about them. Okay. So this is a little bit different than GuideStar um, because it really is meant for individuals who want to connect to services, but it's still a great way to see who's doing the type of work that you're interested in doing in the Philadelphia area. So does anyone have any questions about those resources? I did provide links to both of them in your resource guide. Great. So it looks like Jillian's responded to some questions there. Awesome. <clears throat> awesome. All right. So again, this is a really important first step. Um, you know, you don't want to approach a funder and say, we're the only one providing free meals in Philadelphia, for example. They're, they're going to know. They, no, funders know what's going on um, in the, the philanthropic scene here. So you don't want to pose yourself as the only organization doing this. Um, you know, funders like to see nonprofits working together to meet a common need. So it's really important to know who else is out there, who's doing this work. And again, it can be really helpful for partnerships. Um, and just kind of collaboration, um, especially when you're at the beginning of this. All right, so the next step in the plan is your team. So as you form your nonprofit, your board members are the essential working parts. Most nonprofits don't begin to hire staff at first. They rely on their board members as volunteer workers, as expertise, and as donors. All of these roles just begin to describe the importance of your board. They are the representatives of the public that makes a public charity. Besides being legally essential to the nonprofit, they are the people who are officially in charge of the nonprofit, not the executive director, as we mentioned before during our pop quiz. 
They can, though they rarely do, decide to fire the executive director. What they are always responsible to is the organization's mission above all. Often the search for great board members, ones that give their time, their talent, and their treasure is a never ending effort for a nonprofit. Certainly finding your initial board members are, is a crucial step. These are people whose passion for the mission matches your own and who are able to bring a particular skill like fundraising or accounting to help as well as to add their own donations. You know, we could spend a whole class uh, talking about the board, um, but I do want to mention a couple of great resources. So uh, board source is a great place to find more info on the logistics of running a nonprofit board. They are nationally recognized authority on the subject and have many free and inexpensive resources. For recruiting board members, you may want to post uh, the opportunity on volunteer sites like Idealist or Volunteer Match. You can also reach out to board prep programs. They often maintain lists of organizations in need of board members. So a couple of local examples um, include Young Involved Philadelphia, which works with um, younger people who want to serve on boards, um, as well as the Arts and Business Council's Business on Board program. Um, that one does have a fee associated with it though. Now, ideally you want to grow your organization with paid staff but know that until finances and fundraising are reliable, you and your board may be doing the work of the organization without having anyone paid. Know also that not everyone should be drafted as a board member. You recruit board members from those who have the time and passion to be part of your organization. You may also want to have a separate group of volunteers who can't commit to being board members, um, but they may work in a formal or informal advisory capacity. You're gonna need all sorts of uh, volunteers. So once you have your board all committed to the mission of your organization, you want to begin to plan out how your programs will go. But as you do that, the number one concern you should have is identifying the need. Note that this is not your need as an individual, as in I need cash to get going. The need is the need that the community you are serving has, and you are, <clears throat> excuse me, and you have to be able to document this need. So how do you know this is a problem for the people that you'll be working with? You may think it's obvious, but it might not be obvious to everyone. So how else do you document it? What kind of evidence do you have for the need you're serving? Sometimes you have specific anecdotal examples. Sometimes, and this is a good idea, you have representatives from the community on your board. And sometimes you use statistics, which you gather through surveys or through research. Government agencies like the Census Bureau or city or county agencies may collect statistics that can be of use to you. Also universities, national organizations, and news media may have done research as well. A great free resource that combines a lot of federal data um, is Policy Map. Um, we included a link to that um, in the resource guide, but that's a great way to put in a zip code or a city and find a bunch of statistics um, about the population that you're serving. And then locally, we have the Pew Charitable Trust that puts out a lot of great reports on Philadelphia. They recently put out a um, state of the city for 2021 report um, that has a lot of great information. So again, links to both of those resources are in your resource guide, um, as well as a few others that I think might be useful to you as well. All of these provide the documentation of the need, the clear answer to the question, why are you necessary? The need statement is one part of your case and is, <clears throat> excuse me, as in the case you'll be making for supporting your organization. The case is an essential part of telling your story. Um, so putting together a need statement or a case statement can really help you think through what it is you're trying to address, what the need is within your community. Programs and services should flow directly from the need, as in a story. Here is the problem and here are my solutions. For those of you who have ever put together a grant proposal before, um, you know, this will look familiar. Program design requires you to think broadly, 
Those are your goals and more specifically what your outcomes are. You may even want to use a logic model to outline this. The benefit of a logic model structure is that it leads you to understand that funders and other investors will always want to know what specific outcomes you're striving for and how you're going to measure your success. Planning ahead means that you collect the data and info that will be necessary to evaluate your success. Um, this is a really important part of not just grants and getting money, but about your organization. You know, how are you going to know you're successful? What are the programs and services you're going to offer? How are you going to track statistics on that to know that you um, to know that you're successful? To know that you're serving the community or meeting their needs. Um, so this is all an important piece to the planning process. So you don't want to just think about we're going to offer X program but how are we going to evaluate that program and know that it's successful? It's all part of this planning process. And this is another part of making the case. And that case leads to finances and fundraising. So budgeting might be the scariest part of a new nonprofit. Um, even for established nonprofits, a lot of people are scared of the, the budgeting and financials. So how do you know what everything will cost if you've never done this before? Well, budgeting is simply the numerical representation of everything you've planned so far. You've justified the need for this money by making your case, and now you need to say where that money will go. The more detail you have on your programs, the more you'll know what expenses you have to cover. Your resource guide has some resources and tools for creating a budget. Um, note that when you do, that, do this, um, that a budget involves not just expenses, so what you're spending your money on, but also your income. So while you're thinking about how you're going to spend your money, you're going to want to think about where that income, how you're going to bring money um, in it. So fundraising, is it coming from donors? Is it coming from um, grants, earned income, that type of thing. So before they can win foundation grants, nonprofits need to demonstrate a history of diversified fundraising, including individual donations. It's best to think about how to balance potential sources of income, like individual donations, events, or earned income, so that you're not relying on any one source too much. Um, so we talk about this in our introduction to fundraising planning class. And your resource guide includes a link to a recording of that class. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about how to create a diverse fundraising plan, um, that's a really great uh, source to check out. Whoops. <clears throat> um, finally, a word about financial management. No one is going to want to donate large sums of money to you if you don't know how to handle it correctly. Having only one person handle all the checks, keep the accounts, and make financial decisions is a recipe for disaster. So who can help you with this? Well, other than your board, you should be on the lookout for local and statewide resources that help nonprofits. Most states have a statewide organization, like here in Pennsylvania, we have the Pennsylvania Association of Nonprofit Organizations, or PANO, which can help uh, you find assistance for your specific administrative needs. I've also heard from a number of nonprofits that money spent on hiring an accountant is always money well spent. You're better off setting yourself up for success at the beginning and building in good practices and procedures um, from the onset. In your resource guide, you'll find a link to a recent blog post that we put out called Ask an Accountant. Um, we, we had a local um, accountant um, answer common questions that nonprofits had about hiring an, account, an accountant, costs of different um, types of reports. Um, it also has some really great tips and insights and an FAQ section. Um, so again, it's a really important piece of this. I'll also note um, that a lot of nonprofits think that once they get that 501c3 status, all these grants are just going to come flying in the door. Um, unfortunately, that is not the case. Typically speaking, we tell nonprofits that you shouldn't expect to get a grant within the first two years of operating. Um, and that's just because you don't always have that track record of success, which funders want to see 
um, because they see giving you a grant as an investment um, and they want to make sure that they will see a return on that investment. So if you don't have that track record, it can be a little bit difficult to secure grant funding. So one um, last step in the plan, and then I, I know we have some questions come in, so I will um, take a look at those. So it's important to remember that no one will support you if they don't know that you exist. So relying on just one way to get the word out is risky. Think of who might be interested in what you do and where they find their information. So are they kids under 18? Where do kids under 18 get their information? Keep in mind that only half of them use Facebook. Do kids under 18 read a print newspaper? Are they seniors over 65? Where do they get their information? Sorry. Uh, do the people you work with get their news from church, from school, from their doctor? Think about all the ways that your customers or clients might find out about you. And don't just think in terms of what you will do. One of the best ways to spread the word about a new resource is to partner with an existing resource with a large audience. So I think a really good example of this is um, our colleagues in the BRIC um, that work with job seekers are launching a new database of um, job training programs. So while they're certainly planning to market um, this database to job seekers, they also know it's important to get the word out about this resource to other nonprofits and partners that specifically work with job seekers. So you wanna not just think about who the end user is, but who else works with that same population who can help spread the word. So trust me, you will not be able to exist in a vacuum as a nonprofit. At least if you operate um, without collaborative partners, you won't exist for long. So I know we have some questions come in. So I'm gonna take a look at the chat. Um, well, it looks like Jillian and Evie have answered some questions. Thank you both. Okay. All right, so I think we're good for right now, actually. Um, so this method falls in strategic partnerships. Yeah, I mean, you definitely want to have strategic partnerships um, throughout the life cycle of your nonprofit, but for marketing and research, that is definitely an important thing. You know, you don't want to be the only one, you know, yelling out into the world, you know, come, come learn about us. Um, the more other, more partners, more um, nonprofits that know about you, the more likely that they're going to share the information about the work you're doing um, with the people that they see, with the people that they touch. So what would a MOU look like for marketing rather than services? So um, for those of you unfamiliar, MOU is a memorandum, memorandum of understanding. So for this is much less formal than that. This is just, hey, we are offering this service. We think the people that you work with would benefit from this. Can you share this information? Um, so it's, it's nothing as official as that. <clears throat> um, so somebody asked, does it make more sense for the founder to be a board member or the executive director, assuming the founder does not plan to take a salary? Um, I don't know if I can answer that question. Um, I, you know, I think that that depends on a lot of different things. Um, I would recommend, you know, speaking, you know, with a lawyer to figure out the best way to set this up. Um, it's a good question, um, but yeah, unfortunately, I don't think I can provide a specific answer to that. All right, moving on have a couple more things um, that you should probably consider when putting your plan together. So do you have a space? Um, you know, I hear quite a number of nonprofits who could get started if, quote, they had only had someone to buy a building for them. But instead, maybe think about using a shared space, either free space donated by a church or other partner, or a less expensive space in a collaborative um, space. Um, is it enough for what you need to do? So thinking creatively and not necessarily being tied to, I need this specific space um, to fulfill my mission. I've worked with a number of nonprofits who start by 
going into community centers or parks and rec centers or schools and offering their services. And then as they get that track record of success, as they become more popular, then they start looking at spaces so that they can have their own space to do their work. But they start smaller and think about where in the community they can reach, um, reach their, their clients. Um, equipment. You know, thinking about, you know, what is actually essential to what you need to do. You know, these days with that so much being virtual, you know, having computers and the right software, or Zoom subscriptions, you know, might be really important to the work that you do. Um, can you find donations of this equipment? Um, is it something that you could share with another nonprofit? Do you need insurance? Um, if you work with kids, you're definitely going to need it along with background checks. Um, and if you have a vehicle that's essential to your services, you'll need that as well. Um, and sometimes your board may want insurance to cover them in case of legal liability. Um, there's also human resources and annual reporting to think about. As you grow, do you have policies for how you handle your employees and benefits? Um, do you know what's required for annual reporting for your state, for the IRS? Um, I know Evie mentioned earlier that um, that's something that VIP can help with if you're looking to put together, you know, a, a, an employee manual, um, then that might be a helpful resource to reach out to, to Philly VIB to help you with that. So these are all other things you're going to have to consider. Um, you know, this is more the logistical stuff and less of the ideological stuff, um, but it's certainly just as important to the planning process. All right, let's take a look and see what questions came in. Um, as far as insurance, um, specifically for volunteers, I don't know about specific requirements. Um, again, this is something that you could possibly reach out to Philly VIP about um, to make sure all your bases are covered. Um, but it, it is a good question and something you should definitely think about. Um, so good question. Um, as far as insurance being required, um, for the board, again, I'm not sure, um, that might be, um, it's certainly something that's definitely a good thing to have, um, as far as specific requirements by the state, um, I'm not sure about that though. So now that we've talked through the plan and what you're going to have to think about in order to start a nonprofit, um, it's also really important to think about the alternatives. So um, keep in mind that you don't have to start a nonprofit to provide a service to your community. So I've listed out a few suggestions. Um, and keep in mind that if you do decide to go with one of these or you know, you want to explore one of them, it doesn't mean that you can't start a nonprofit in the future. Choosing one of these options may actually help you build a better foundation and set yourself up for success down the line. So first we have volunteer. So research organizations that are doing work in the community, just like during that environmental scan, um, to see, you know, who else is already doing this work and if they need volunteers. Not only are you helping out an existing organization, but you are also giving back in a hands-on way. Plus, it will give you a sense of the work that is currently being done to address the needs of the community. Work for a nonprofit. Many people love the idea of starting a nonprofit, but they may not have experience working in the sector. Gain experience for um, working for a nonprofit and get a sense of the sector's strengths and weaknesses while improving your skills. Plus, you'll get a paycheck. Serve on a board. Become a leader in your community by serving on a board of a local nonprofit. Not only will you be supporting an organization's mission by sharing your expertise, skills, and passion, you'll also gain leadership skills and expand your network. Explore B Corps or social enterprises. You don't have to be a nonprofit organization to do good in your community. In the past few years, we've seen 
many businesses strive to make a positive impact on their local and global communities. Depending on your venture, it may make sense to start a business with a social mission. A couple of big name examples are Tom's and Warby Parker. Both companies donate products whenever a customer makes a purchase. Some local examples here in Philadelphia are United by Blue and Saxby's. Social enterprises may also focus on the environment, volunteerism, and transparency. Your resource guide has a link to a blog post I published last week that goes into more detail um, about these alternatives to um, starting a nonprofit, as well as providing links to additional resources. I'll also add that in light of COVID-19, we have seen a lot of unique and innovative solutions to helping out our communities that don't require 501c3 status. I'm sure you've all seen examples in your own neighborhoods and communities, um, but one that comes to mind for me is the community fridges that we have um, seen popping up across the city to help alleviate hunger. Community refrigerators are a great example of individuals, businesses, and communities coming together to meet a need without tax exempt status. And if you have other examples that you've seen in your neighborhoods or community, feel free to share those in the chat. And then I wanted to kind of separate this last alternative about fiscal sponsorship, just because it is slightly more complicated um, than these other ones that I have mentioned. Um, and I have a whole slide dedicated specifically to fiscal sponsorship. So I have um, a definition on the screen here. Fiscal sponsorship is a legal arrangement between a 501c3 and an individual or group, giving the non-exempt entity access to the benefits of a 501c3 without dealing with the administrative side of operating. Basically, it's a way for a person or a group to partner with an existing nonprofit in order to get grants and other donations. Sounds relatively simple. Um, you just have to find someone who's willing to partner with you and then they take the financial responsibility for you while you write the grants and the donation requests and do the work. Many fiscal sponsors don't do this for free. They do want a percentage of your donations for administrative fees. But in return, you are not only getting access to their 501c3 status, but oftentimes you get access to shared services um, or back office services like accounting, marketing, or space. Plus, it means you're not doing this alone. You have the support in some cases of your fiscal sponsor. Fiscal sponsorship is a great way to test out an idea without making as much of an upfront financial commitment. For example, one of our partners uh, recently decided they wanted to spin off part of their consulting business as a nonprofit. They found a fiscal sponsor and tested out their idea for a number of months. Over time, though, they realized that this wasn't the structure that they wanted, so they ended their fiscal sponsorship and the nonprofit. It was a far less complicated and messy process um, than if they had gotten their own 501c3, 501c3 status, um, which would have then needed to be dissolved. Um, and keep in mind that if you start a, a nonprofit, get 501c3 status, and just decide one day, eh, I don't want to do this anymore. It's not like the nonprofit just goes away or you get to keep any money you've brought in. Um, any of the assets have to go to an, a nonprofit organization with a similar mission. Um, so something to keep in mind as you're thinking about this process. So next week, we are doing a whole workshop just on fiscal sponsorship. Um, it's called Fiscal Sponsorship 101. Um, it is being presented by uh, Tavani DeVore, who works for the Urban Affairs Coalition, which is a, a local organization here in Philadelphia that does have a fiscal sponsorship program. So if this is something you're interested in exploring more, I highly recommend checking out that workshop. It's going to go into much more detail um, about fiscal sponsorship. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of starting a nonprofit? I'm gonna briefly talk about those um, before I, I bring up the nonprofit um, startup assessment tool. So the reward for going through the process of becoming a nonprofit is your eligibility to get grants and for people to make tax, uh, to take a tax deduction if they donate to you. And of course your organization's income will not be taxable as long as it's mission related. 
Also, the formal structure where the board is in charge means that no one person owns the organization. So were something terrible to happen and the nonprofit went bankrupt, then as long as the board members performed their duties in good faith, they will not have a financial responsibility to pay the nonprofit's debts. So the advantages of starting a nonprofit is that tax exemption, which allows you to, um, your donors to um, get a tax deduction when they donate to you, and then it allows you to get grants and you also have this more formal structure. What are the disadvantages though? Starting a nonprofit is costly, as some people have mentioned um, before. And often those costs come out of pocket of the founder and the board, at least early on. There's also a lot of paperwork that the IRS and the state require, including those annual filings to the IRS to maintain your existence as a nonprofit. And because there's no one person who owns a nonprofit, there's always shared control. An executive director or single board member will never have everything his or her own way. Sometimes when people approach me and they're like, I'm trying to decide if I want to start a nonprofit or a for-profit, I ask them if they want to be the one in charge. And if they say yes, I say you shouldn't start a nonprofit. Finally, as we've mentioned before, it's all public. Your 990s, those financial reports to the IRS are public documents that show anyone who the highest paid uh, employees are, how much you're spending on fundraising, and many other details that you may be reluctant to publicize. So what should you do? Well, I can't tell you specifically one way or another, I can show you a tool that can help you make that decision. Um, so in just a moment, I'm gonna pull up the nonprofit startup assessment tool. I did see we had some things come in in the chat though, so I'm gonna take a look at those before we do that. So it looks like my colleagues have answered the questions that have come in. So thank you both. All right. So we're going to take a look at the nonprofit assessment tool. So Candid, um, that organization that I mentioned earlier, has come up with a resource to help you make this decision. So this is an electronic tool that you can use for free um, through the Candid, Candid Learning website. So it has 75 questions that will help you evaluate where you are and it will enable you to create a report that gives you suggestions, resources, and insights. So each of the sections will rate your readiness with red, yellow, or green. Red is a warning. You may not be ready to move forward without some changes. Yellow tells you to be careful. There are some things that you're missing. And green is a go. You're in a good place. You can retake the survey at any time. And you can also take some of the survey now or at any point and then complete it later. So you don't have to sit down and answer all 75 questions um, at once. So I'm gonna do a brief demonstration of this um, and answer any questions that anyone has. All right. So to access um, the tool, I did include a link to it on your resource guide, but I'll also show you how to get to it through Candid Learning's website. Um, so I'm on learning.candid.org. And if I go to resources and nonprofit startup resources, that is going to take me to their page on um, startup resources for nonprofits. So in addition to the nonprofit assessment, if you scroll down, you can also look at resources by state. So you could click on Pennsylvania and learn about startup resources specific to the state of Pennsylvania. But for now, we are going to um, take a look at the tool. So here it explains some information about what it is and who should take advantage of it. Um, so you're gonna click on go to my assessment. Um, at this point, if you don't have a candid account, it'll ask you to create one for free. I already have an account and I'm signed in. So it took me right to my assessment. So I've already done some of the assessment um, and you can see right here, it tells me I've completed 17 of the 75 questions. And when I scroll down, you'll see the different sections that are part of the assessment, as well as how many questions are in each section. So we have getting started, inspiration and goals, financial capital, human capital, social capital, program development, market analysis, 
volunteers and board, and then nonprofit knowledge. So if you have started one of these sections, um, it'll say continue. So for this one, I've, I've already answered one of the eight questions. Um, for the social capital one, I haven't answered any of those questions. So it's telling me to start. And then for this last section, nonprofit knowledge, um, I've already completed all those questions. So you'll see I now have the option to edit my answers and view my insights um, and resources. But if you were starting from the beginning, just wanna show you what that would look like. I'm gonna click um, continue for getting started. And then on the screen, it's going to open up um, the questions. So you'll see it's very simple, easy to use format. Um, so for the getting started section, it wants to know what your organization's focus is. So you can choose all the ones that apply to you. You can also skip the questions if you'd like, um, if you don't feel like answering it or you don't know the answer. Um, and you can just go through each of these sections um, and answer with the most appropriate answer to you and to the status of your organization. And then once you have gone through, um, so I'm just putting in some random answers for this just to show you what this looks like. Um, obviously your answers will depend on what you're doing. <clears throat> and then once you have answered the questions and you click complete, you can then review your answers. If you want to change any of them, you can continue to the next section in the assessment or you can view your insights and resources. So once you've done that, this is where it will tell you um, or give you insight into what you, based on the answers you've supplied, it'll give you insight as well as some additional resources. So for example, this resource is showing you where you can learn more about putting together a nonprofit mission. Um, for this one about incorporation in your state, it gives you resources to incorporate in your specific state. So you can see that not only are you answering questions and thinking through this as part of the planning process, but you're also getting um, resources that can help you either answer the question or build your knowledge about that specific section. And at any point, you can go to the other section. So for example, I had already completed the nonprofit knowledge section, and it's giving me this little green triangle here, which means I'm good to go. Um, so as I mentioned before, red means that you need some work, yellow means proceed with caution, green means you're good to go. You can also download your report. So if you wanted a PDF version, once you've completed this, you can download a PDF version of this. And at any point you can return to the dashboard and go to different sections. It's very easy to stop and start this. Um, if you only have time to complete one section today, that's totally fine. You can come back to it at any other point um, and then you can um, continue where you left off or make changes to other um, questions that you've answered. Also, when you're on the insights and resources section here, it also has this option, how to interpret the results, which will explain what the red, yellow, and green mean. So again, this is just a really helpful tool for thinking through this planning process and knowing if you are ready to start a nonprofit organization. So does anyone have any questions? No questions right now. <clears throat> so <clears throat> then um, what, you know, what, what are your next steps? Um, see here. 
<clears throat> so I definitely recommend taking the nonprofit um, startup assessment um, using that tool. Um, you may also be interested in viewing the introduction to fundraising planning workshop. Um, so we have links to both of those in your resource guide. So definitely um, take a look at both of those. Um, so I do have one more poll question for those of you who have stuck around. Um, I'm curious what you're going to do after this class. So what is your next step? Um, so I've launched a poll. Um, so we have a few options. Um, first is you're going to take the nonprofit startup assessment. Um, next, you're going to explore an alternative like fiscal sponsorship or volunteering. Um, maybe some of you are ready to go and you're going to jump in and you're going to try to get that 501c3 status. Uh, maybe this sounds awful and scary and overwhelming and you're going to run for the hills. <laughs> Um, or maybe you have some other idea. Feel free to add it in the chat. Um, I know this is not inclusive of all the potential options uh, available, but I am curious to know what you plan to do next. So take a minute and answer that poll. So I am going to stop the poll and share the results so you can all see how other people on the call are feeling. So it looks like we're, we're fairly split <laughs> um, with the four people who answered um, each choosing something different. So that is great. And I wish you all the best of luck with whatever it is you're going to um, participate in next. So, you know, we have a few minutes. Um, I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions that you have. Jillian's going to put a link to the program evaluation in the chat. Um, as a reminder, within 48 hours, I will be sending out an email with a link to the resource guide um, with any updated links, as well as a link to the recording. So if you're interested in viewing any part of this in the future, um, you can do that. So if anyone has any questions, um, please let me know. Happy to try to answer them or point you towards um, a resource. So thank you both. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thanks to your great questions. Sorry if I wasn't able to answer all of them. Um, but hopefully at this point, you at least have a better sense of what this process is like, how to start putting a plan together and where you can find answers um, to some of this additional information. And I hope you'll all come to the Fiscal Sponsorship 101 class um, a week from today. So again, really great option for anyone who wants to start their own nonprofit um, or test out an idea. And keep in mind that you can always get your own 501c3 status. You know, working with a fiscal sponsor doesn't mean that that's the format, format you have to take forever. So, and Evie's still here if anyone has any questions for her as well.